Little Women, Chapter 6, Castles in the Air. Laurie lay swinging to and fro in his hammock one warm September afternoon, wondering what his neighbors were doing, but too lazy to go and find out. Staring up into the green gloom of the chestnut trees above him, he dreamed dreams of all sorts and was imagining himself tossing on the ocean in a voyage round the world when the sound of voices brought him ashore in a flash. Peeping through the meshes of his hammock, he saw the marches coming out, as if bound on some expedition. What in the world are those girls about now? thought Laurie. Each wore a large flapping hat, a brown linen pouch slung over one shoulder, and carried a long staff. Meg had a cushion, Joe a book, Beth a basket, and Amy a portfolio. All walked quietly through the garden, out at the little back gate, and began to climb the hill that lay between the house and the river. Well, said Laurie to himself, to have a picnic and never ask me. They can't be going in the boat, for they haven't got the key. Perhaps they forgot it. I'll take it to them and see what's going on. The girls were quite out of sight by the time he leaped the fence and ran after them. Taking the shortest way to the boathouse, he waited for them to appear, but no one came, and when he went up the hill to take a look. A group of pines covered one part of the hill, and from the heart of this green spot came the sound of their voices. Lori went and peeped through the greenery and saw the sisters sitting together in a shady nook, with sun and shadow flickering over them, the wind lifting their hair and cooling their hot faces. Meg sat on a cushion, sewing with her white hands and looking as fresh and sweet as a rose in her pink dress among the green. Beth was sorting the pine cones that lay thick under the hemlock nearby, for she made pretty things of them. Amy was sketching a group of ferns, and Joe was knitting as she read aloud. The boy felt that he ought to go away because he was uninvited, yet he stayed, because home seemed very lonely and this quiet party in the woods seemed most attractive to his restless spirit. Beth looked up and saw him and beckoned him with a smile. May I come in, please, or shall I be a bother? He asked. Joe answered, of course you may. We should have asked you before, only we thought you wouldn't care for such a girl's game as this. I always liked your games, but if Meg doesn't want me, I'll go away. I've no objection. If you do something, it's against the rules to be idle here, replied Meg. Much obliged. I'll do anything if you'll let me stay a bit, for it's as dull as the desert of Sahara down there. Shall I read, sew, draw, or do all at once? Finish this story while I set my heel, said Joe, handing him the book. Yes, am was the answer. As he began doing his best to prove his gratitude for the favor of an admission into the Busy Bee Society. The story was not a long one. When it was finished, he asked a few questions. Please, ma'am, could I inquire if this highly instructive and charming institution is a new one? We have been going on with it all winter and summer, said Joe. We have tried not to waste our holiday, but each has had a task and worked, with it at a, worked at it with a will. The vacation is nearly over, and we were ever so glad that we didn't dawdle. Yes, I should think so, said Laurie as he thought regrettably, regretfully of his own idle ways. Mother likes to have us out of doors as much as possible, so we bring our work here and have nice times. From this hill, we can look far away and see the country where we hope to live sometime. Joe pointed, and Lori sat up to look, for through an opening in the wood, one could see across the wide blue river, the meadows on the other side, far over the outskirts of the great city to the green hills that rose to meet the sky. The sun was low and the heavens glowed. Gold and purple clouds lay on the hilltops and rising high into the light were silvery white peaks that shone like the towers of some celestial city. How beautiful that is, said Lori. Joe talks about the country where we hope to live sometime, the real country she means with pigs and chickens and haymaking. It would be nice, but I wish the beautiful country there in the sky was real and we could go to it, said Beth. Wouldn't it be fun if all the castles in the air which we make could come true and we could live in them, said Joe. 
I've made such a number, it would be hard to choose which I'd have, said Lori. You'd have to take your favorite one. What is it? asked Meg. If I tell mine, will you tell yours? Yes, if the girls will too. We will, now Lori. After I'd seen as much of the world as I want to, I'd like to settle in Germany and have just as much music as I choose. I'm to be a famous musician myself, and all creation is to rush to hear me, and I'm never to be bothered about money or business, but just enjoy myself and live for what I like. That's my favorite castle. What's yours, Meg? Margaret seemed to find it a little hard to tell hers, but finally said, I should like a lovely house full of all sorts of luxurious things, nice food, pretty clothes, handsome furniture, pleasant people, and heaps of money. I am to be mistress of it and manage it as I like, with plenty of servants, so I never need work a bit. How I should enjoy it, for I wouldn't be idle, but do good and make everyone love me dearly. Why don't you say you'd have a splendid, wise, good husband and some angelic little children? You know your castle wouldn't be perfect without them, said Joe. You'd have nothing but horses, inkstands, and novels in yours, said Meg. Wouldn't I, though? I'd have a stable full of Arabian horses, rooms piled with books, and I'd write out of a magic inkstand so that my works should be as famous as Laurie's music. I want to do something splendid before I go into my castle, something heroic and wonderful that won't be forgotten after I'm dead. I think I shall write books and get rich and famous. That would suit me. So that is my favorite dream. Mine is to stay at home with safe with father and mother and help take care of the family, said Beth. Don't you wish for anything else, asked Lori. Since I had my little piano, I am perfectly satisfied. I only wish we may all keep well and be together, nothing else. Oh, I have ever so many wishes. But the pet one is to be an artist and go to Rome and do fine pictures and be the best artist in the whole world, said Amy. We're an ambitious set, aren't we? Each one of us, but Beth, wants to be rich and famous and gorgeous in every respect. I do wonder if any of us will ever get our wishes, said Lori. I've got the key to my castle in the air, but whether I can unlock the door remains to be seen, said Joe. I've got the key to mine, but I'm not allowed to try it. Hang college, muttered Lori. Here's mine, and Amy waved her pencil. I haven't got any, said Meg. Yes, you have, said Lori. Where? In your face. Nonsense, that's of no use. Wait and see if it doesn't bring you something worth having, replied the boy. If we are alive ten years from now, said Joe, let's meet and see how many of us have got our wishes, or how much nearer we are than now. I hope I shall have done something to be proud of by that time, but I'm such a lazy dog, I'm afraid I shall dawdle, Joe said Lori. You need a motive, Mother says, and when you get it, she is sure you'll work splendidly. Is she? By Jupiter, I will if I only get the chance, cried Lori. I ought to be satisfied to please Grandfather, and I do try, but it's working against the grain, you see, and comes hard. He wants me to be an India merchant as he was, and I'd rather be shot. I hate tea and silk and spices, and every sort of rubbish his old ships bring, and I don't care how soon they go to the bottom when I own them. Going to college ought to satisfy him, for if I give him four years, he ought to let me be off from business. But he's set, and I've got to do just as he did, unless I break away and please myself as my father did. If there was anyone left to stay with the old gentleman, I'd do it tomorrow. I advise you to sail away in one of your ships and never come home again till you have tried your own way, said Joe. That's not right, Joe. You mustn't talk in that way. And Lori mustn't take your bad advice. You should do just what your grandfather wishes, my dear boy, said Meg. Do your best at college, and when he sees that you try to please him, I'm sure he won't be hard or unjust to you. Do your duty, and you'll get your reward. That night, when Beth played piano for Mr. Lawrence, 
Lori standing in the shadow of a curtain, listened to the little charmer, whose simple music always quieted the old man, who sat with his head in his hands, thinking of the dead child he had loved so much. Remembering the conversation of the afternoon, the boy said to himself, I'll let my castle go and stay with the dear old gentleman while he needs me, for I am all he has. Okay. For what, what does Lori mean when he says, I'll let my castle go? This is not one to copy and paste. We're going to come back to this after we um, do go back and look at all of their castles. Um, but first, we have this description of the setting. Joe pointed and Lori sat up to look, for through an opening in the wood, one can see across the wide blue river, the meadows on the other side, the outskirts of the great city, the green hills, um, the sun, the heavens, golden purple clouds. It's just this wonderful description of where they were. So let's copy, highlight all the words, right click copy or control C on your keyboard. And this is where we're going to go back to Little Women and go back to the map. And in this blank area, I'm going to right click paste. And hopefully it does. It just pops up. So now I'm going to grab this text box and drag it down a bit. And it's a little dark. So I'm going to highlight all of the words again. And you don't have to do this if you don't want to. It's okay. But I'm going to highlight all the words and I'm going to change the color to white. And that way it shows up better on that green background. Nice description of the setting where they are. You're in Concord, Massachusetts. Then next we have their castles. Do you remember when we read A Grain of Wheat and Clyde Robert Beulah was telling his parents or his mom about his dream to be a writer, just like Joe, another dream to be a writer and the things that he wanted. And the mother's response was castles in the air and uh, they were not very kind to him. And they basically were telling him that his dreams were not going to come true because their dreams didn't come true. So this was a popular phrase of the time, castles in the air. So a grain of wheat was right around the turn of the century, 1900 to 1910. And this story is taking place 1860 to 1870. So we're only about 30 or 40 years before a grain of wheat. And this phrase, castle in the air, um, is still used in both time periods, meaning their dreams and their wishes for their life. Um, just like a, you know, a castle in the sky is likely to not happen, but it could be. It could end up being your castle on the ground. You should certainly try. It's wonderful to have dreams and goals, and you should always work towards them. Your dreams and goals can change as you grow and get older, um, but whatever they are or turn out to be, you should always work hard towards them. You may not get the original goal or dream, but you might find another one in the process and achieve that one and find yourself to be very happy. Uh, you should just never stop. Never stop dreaming and reaching for your goals. So let's look at Laurie's castle. His castle was to be a famous musician. So let's copy that and go to Laurie's slide. This was first. Let's see where we're going to put this. And hmm, it's definitely dialogue. Let's put it in dialogue. So I'm going to click after the colon, get my cursor there, blinking after the colon, enter on the keyboard once, drop the font down to 10, and then paste. I'm to be a famous musician. Okay, and then I believe the next castle is Meg's. So highlight, and then or right click, copy. Go put Meg's castle on her page. 
click after the last dialog, get your cursor at the bottom there, enter once on the keyboard, and then right click paste or control V. Good, and I'm going to make this a little bit longer. I'm just going to grab that little square right there and drag it down. Whose castle is next? Joe's castle. Of course, she's going to write books and be rich and famous. Copy, right click, copy. And we'll go to Joe's page. And she is full, so watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Joe's name and I'm going to find that plus. when I see that plus that cross sign right there that means I can move her box so I'm going to move her box over to the corner I'm going to click on the dialog text box grab this square here in the middle and I'm going to go straight up so now I've extended this text box and now I have room I can click after the last quote enter once and then right click paste and now I have room for her castle her dream next is Beth Beth's castle is to stay home and be safe with father and mother take care of the family so we'll go to dialogue Click after the last quote there, enter once and paste. And I'll just extend this down a little bit. There we go. Amy's Castle, to go to Rome and be the most famous artist in the world. This is why they said their ambitions were, they were very ambitious. All of them wanted to be rich and famous. Oops. Okay, I don't know what just happened there, but that's not what I want. So I'm going to go back over to this back arrow and undo whatever that was that just happened. There we go. Now I can enter and paste. And that's the last of the castles in the air. All of their dreams to be famous. So what does Lori mean when he says he will let his castle go? He's not talking about a real castle. He's talking about his dream, his dream to live in Germany and be a musician and just play music. He's a pianist also like Beth. So he just wants to play the piano and write music and perform music. And that's all he wants to do. But he realizes that he, without his grandfather, he will have no opportunity to do anything. He owes everything he has to his grandfather, who is very kind and has taken care of him and offered him every luxury, including going to college. And when he realizes um, how special he is and that um, he needs to take care of him, so he will let his dream go and he will do what his grandfather says and what his grandfather wants. Um, there may be a time later in life where he can go back to his castle and pursue his dream but for now he realizes he needs to do, he needs to, to follow his grandfather's wishes for him and do what his grandfather tells him. Chapter seven, secrets. Joe was very busy in the attic for the October days began to grow chilly and the afternoons were short. For two or three hours, the sun lay warmly in the high window showing G Joe seated on the old sofa riding busily with her papers spread out upon a trunk before her, while Scrabble, the pet rat, walked the beams overhead. Joe scribbled away till the last page was filled when she signed her name and threw down her pen, exclaiming, There! I've done my best! If this won't suit, I shall have to wait till I can do better. Lying back on the sofa, she read the manuscript through. Then she tied it up with red ribbon and sat a minute looking at it. Joe pulled out another set of papers from her desk and, putting both in her pocket, crept downstairs. She put on her hat and jacket and, going to the back entry window, got out upon the roof of a low porch, swung herself down to the grassy bank, and took a roundabout way to the road. Once there, she hailed a passing public coach and rolled away to town. If anyone had been watching her, he would have 
thought her movements strange, for on getting out of the coach, she went off in a hurry till she reached a certain number in a certain busy street. She went into the doorway, looked up the stairs, pulled her hat over her eyes, and walked up the stairs. In ten minutes, Joe came running downstairs with a very red face. Lori, idling his time away in a billiards hall across the street, happened to see her leave the building, and he came out and approached her. "'What are you up to, Joe?' he asked. What are you doing? What were you doing, sir? I have billiards at home, but it's no fun unless you have good players. So, as I'm fond of it, I come sometimes and have a game with Ned Moffat or some of the other fellows. Oh, dear, I'm so sorry. Well, you're, you'll get to liking it better and better and will waste time and money and grow like those dreadful boys. I did hope you'd stay respectable and be a satisfaction to your friends, said Joe. I like harmless fun now and then, don't you? But don't get wild, will you? Lori walked in silence for a few minutes, and Joe watched him, wishing she had held her tongue, for his eyes looked angry. Are you going to deliver lectures all the way home? he asked. Because if you are, I'll go another way. If you are not, I'd like to walk with you and tell you something very interesting. I won't preach any more, and I'd like to hear the news. It's a secret, and I'll tell you. And if I tell you, you must tell me yours. You won't tease me in private? I never tease, said Lori. Well, said Joe, I've left two stories with the newspaper man, and he's to give his answer next week. Hurrah for Miss March, the famous American authoress, cried Lori. Hush, it won't come to anything, I dare say. But I couldn't rest till I had tried. And I said nothing about it because I didn't want anyone else to be disappointed. It won't fail. Won't it be fun to see them in print? Joe was pleased with the thought, but said, What's your secret? Play fair. I may get into trouble for telling, but I didn't promise not to, so I will. I know where Meg's glove is. Is that all, said Joe? He whispered a few words in Joe's ear. She said, How do you know? Saw it. Where? In his pocket? All this time? Yes. Isn't that romantic? No, it's horrid. Don't you like it? Of course I don't. It's ridiculous. It won't be allowed. The idea of anybody coming to take Meg away. No, thank you. Lately she had felt that Margaret was fast getting to be a woman and Lori's secret made her dread the separation which must surely come sometime, and now seemed very near. For the next week or two, Joe behaved so strangely that her sisters wondered about her. She rushed to the door when the postman rang, was rude to Mr. Brooke whenever they met, would sit looking at Meg with a sad face, and Lori and she were always making signs to one another until the girls declared that they had both lost their wits. On the second Saturday, after Joe got out of the window, Meg, as she sat sewing at her window, was scandalized by the sight of Lori chasing Joe all over the garden and finally capturing her in Amy's bower. What went on there? Meg could not see, but shrieks of laughter were heard, followed by the murmur of voices and a great flapping of newspapers. What shall we do with that girl? She never will behave like a young lady, sighed Meg. I hope she won't. She is so funny and dear as she is, said Beth. It's very difficult, but we can never make her as she should be, added Amy. In a few minutes, Joe bounced in, laid herself on the sofa, and pretended to read. Have you anything interesting there? asked Meg. Nothing but a story. Won't amount to much, I guess, returned Joe. You'd better read it aloud. That will amuse us and keep you out of mischief, said Amy. What's the name of the story? asked Beth. The Rival Painters. That sounds well. Read it, said Meg. With a loud ahem <clears throat> and a long breath, Joe began to read very fast. The girls listened with interest, for the tale was romantic. Who wrote it? asked Beth. The reader suddenly sat up, cast away the paper, and replied, Your sister. You? cried Meg. 
It's very good, said Amy. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, my Joe, I am so proud. And Beth began to hug her sister. How delighted they all were. How Meg wouldn't believe it till she saw the words, Miss Josephine March, actually printed in the paper. How proud Mrs. March was when she knew it. How Joe laughed with tears in her eyes and how the newspaper passed from hand to hand. Tell us all about it. When did it come? How much did you get for it? What will father say? cried the family, all in one breath, as they clustered about Joe. Stop jabbering, girls, and I'll tell you everything, said the author. Having told how she submitted her stories, Joe added, and when I went to get my answer, the man said he liked them both, but he didn't pay beginners, only let them print in his paper. So I have let him have the two stories, and today this was sent to me, and Lori caught me with it and insisted on seeing it. So I let him, and he said it was good, and I shall write more, and he's going to get the next paid for. And I am so happy, for in time I may be able to support myself and help the girls. Ha! Huh, Joe's breath gave out here. To be independent and earn the praise of those she loved were the dearest wishes of her heart, and this seemed to be the first step towards that happy end. So exciting, her first story is published in the paper. Now, she didn't get paid for this one, but she looks forward to getting paid for the next. There's only two things to copy and paste here. So this first one, what shall we do with that girl? She never will behave like a young lady. So this is an observation by Meg. So let's copy this, right click copy or control C. And let's go put this on Joe's page because this is how Meg sees Joe, and others do too. Drop the font down to 10. There we go. She won't behave like a young lady. Poor thing. <laughs> She's always running around. She's more tomboyish. Lots of girls are. In this day, though, it was more proper to be like a lady. And then here's another thing that is not what was of, of the time. To be independent and earn the praise of those she loved were the dearest wishes of her heart. Now, the independent part, she wants to have her own job and earn her own money. She doesn't want to have to depend on her husband, which was the common role of most women in those days. But she didn't want to have to depend on a husband. She wanted to be able to be independent of her own. So let's copy and paste that. Copy it. Control right, right click, copy, or control C. And let's go put this on Joe's page. And let's put this under actions. And so I've got the cursor there. And then I'm going to right click, paste. Those are her dearest, I don't know if that was really an action. That's okay, we'll leave it there for now. We can move it if we need to on another time. And I believe that was the last one. Yes, it was, good.